Tuesday, July 22nd, 2014. Will you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Anderson? Here. 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 Okay, we'll move on to item 1.2, which is adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Questions? You have, Mr. Petrie, you want to say? It is. This point one we need to amend to add the language. Um, we would like to add six grade digits to be a pilot only. It will not be part of the full text of the document. I put it in the notes. Yeah. So when we take a vote, we'll all be Yeah. Um, also, uh, item 4.4, 4, which is the administrative supplements. I'd like to have a, a work session discussion, or it may be more appropriate to have an executive session discussion on those. Um, I need to, we need to touch on the matter in place. Can we have that executive se uh, session discussion uh, or work session discussion first? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, felt you all. We have you. That we can discuss it in the business session. I won't give that to the um, Also, uh, 12.9, at least when I caught the agenda, we had an update on, an ins on the insurance quote in work session, but we have an action item for the insurance contract. Um, I'm not understanding if that's about the same, uh, or did that get changed since Friday? But uh, I had, uh, I think, uh, Is it? Yeah, I don't see it on the next one. Is that a 4.9 insurance update? Under work session. Yeah, that's under work session. And what's the difference between that and the action item we had on insurance? It's an update on the questions that were asked about the possibility of doing uh, some changes in the. Uh, Sorry, the uh, deductibles to see if that would help lower rates. That's what was asked at the last board meeting. So I had that looked at, and that's what we discussed. But it's approved at the last board meeting. Yeah. So I, I, it was I approved at the June 10th board meeting because we have to have insurance effective in July 1. Yeah. What was said was we had to have uh, insurance by the end of that month, and we were not going to have a board meeting by the end of that month. Right. It was approved. <clears throat> then it, the comments were, can we check these deductibles? And those can be changed even when we're in the contract. Right. So the deductibles were checked. Correct. Okay. I understand that. Thank you. So is the amendment on the roll call? Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Attorney? Regano? Yes. Stuckey? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, item 1.3, approval of the June 10th meeting minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, one second there. Who moved? Mr. Mm -hmm. Stuckey. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For some reason, there's one in action on here for this. Um, okay. Roll call. Um, Malone? Yes. Petroni? Yes. Regano? Yes. Stuckey? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Motion passes. Item 2.1, Spinbrough Education Association report. Is there any such report? And 
Participation prearranged. I believe we have two people that have asked to speak. Just to, we haven't done it in a while, so as a review, make sure the microphone's on. Um, we'll open the floor for public comment during our public participation session of the Board of Education meeting. Remember your comments must adhere to board policy 0169-1. This means that the entire public participation session may last to a maximum of 30 minutes. Each person speaking shall be limited to five, a maximum of five minutes. It is expected that all public comment during the public participation session must be related to board work session agenda items. Individuals speaking shall not direct any of their specific comments at Board of Education employees. By this, I mean by referring to an employee by their name or position. As Board President, I reserve the right to interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. With that, will Dr. Cole speak? If you want to hold that up, this, I think that'd be better. When students are taught about the American Revolution, they will find almost every founding father has been omitted. Students will not discover and admire the diligence and patriotism of great men like John Adams, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin. George Washington will never be mentioned, save for his farewell address only. So please enlighten me on how an American can feel proud of their heritage and grateful of the arduous journey the founding fathers made to establish our country when their names are never even mentioned. When the students reach the Civil War, they will not be educated on the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the Gettysburg Address, or even the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. If these drastic changes to the story of American history were not enough, students will not learn about the valor of Dwight D. Eisenhower or any other military commander for that matter. The chapter on World War II also omits the Battle of the Bulge, the Battle of Midway, the name Adolf Hitler and Harry S. Truman completely. On that note, the new curriculum will state that the decision to drop the atomic bomb has raised questions about American values. Not even the Civil Rights Movement will be covered as it ought to be. Martin Luther King Jr. will not be mentioned because of the sacrifices he made to better this country. The curriculum plan, a document that was once five pages, has now expanded to 98. These 98 pages effectively instill a sense of disillusionment and a loss of, a loss of pride in the greatness of this country and the heroic figures that worked to ensure the same. I fear that when America's youth is not taught about the sacrifices made or the courage required to keep America thriving, we will never stay the mighty nation I know we can be. Because of this nightmarish news, I am pleading with the Board of Education to, as elected representatives, as well as Americans, to stand up against the malicious agenda behind the new curriculum. I was once a student in AP US history myself, and I know how significant these changes would be. So please, for the sake of our fine schools and the young patriots that walk the halls, do something about the nightmare that is coming. Participant, Thomas. 
Not here. Okay. It's also worth mentioning to our speaker that didn't you just receive an award from the Optimist yes. Club? Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Very well spoken. Nice job. Um, I, moving on to 2.4, public participation um, uh, and introduction of guests. So, are there any, any other guests or participants we should know? Moving on to 3.1, uh, Treasurer Report. Um, yes, these are for the financials for June 2014. And I uploaded the thank you James for showing me that there was no graphs on some of them. But I did re-upload them and they're on there. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes, question. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the actual versus the five-year. Okay. Which, which uh, last column? Which uh, are we talking about the recent five-year that we just updated, or the last five-year that? We're... The most recent up, the most recent five-year, the May update, is the one that will be in the actual. I'm assuming you're looking at the budget to actual I sheet. Am. Sorry, I should have said. No, that. you're fine. Um, yes, and that is the one that matches the May update. And so that's suggesting that we're starting off July one at two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars less. Less, correct. Um, there was a few things, and it would kind of take a little bit of time to go into it. Um, there was a revenue stream that we didn't receive in in June that typically we always receive in. It was our catastrophic cost reimbursement. It was $55,000. We didn't get it in until July. Um, so they, therefore, that revenue didn't come in. Also, I noticed when we were do, going through the closing process that revenue that's typically posted as revenue then typically you post your expenses from that revenue. Instead, the revenue was posted with deductions to the revenue, which shouldn't be deductions. They should be posted as the revenue as a whole, and then the deductions should be posted as expenses. So that's something that I corrected in, in my office, and that from going forward, they'll be posted the way that I'm used to them being posted. I just didn't know that they were being posted that way. And then um, there's a couple of our expenses that have came in a little bit over anticipated, which were one of them, the main ones, was our sub costs. So I'm kind of trying to look into that to figure out why our sub costs were higher than anticipated in the last quarter of our billing process. But the two together are basically what the, the differences were. So the revenue actually should have been reflected higher um, than, it, than it's reflected because there were deductions posted out of the revenue instead of the revenue posted as it was and then posted deductions as expenses. So that's been corrected. So is this, is this going to change our five-year buying No, we're going to monitor it. Obviously, the five-year is something that, you know, expenses don't always come in exactly how you predict or the revenue isn't exactly what it, you know you predict. I mean, it's all a, it's a it's an ongoing document. But I'm really looking as we go through the first couple months of the year to analyze our expenses and to kind of see if we're in line with where we feel or if we do need to make adjustments. But it's too early to tell. So the the sub program that we have is with the Warren County ESC. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That's and that was designed to. Save us time. Well, it also gives us a larger pool of subs. I know that I guess that before my time that was an issue that we didn't have enough subs or enough of a pool of subs, and they have a lot more resources at the ESC to provide us. Um, Cost-wise, I'm not sure if that is the most cost-efficient. So that's something we can look at also to determine if that really is. having the ESC. Um, you know, provide those services. That'll be something we need to, to analyze after a full year. Would you like to? Just if I could interrupt. Sure, absolutely. Um, or add to. A lot of the administrative costs are, are placed in uh, through the county. For example, if we have a sub like we did this year, um, that we have some disciplinary issues. Through their contract, we do not handle those disciplinary issues. We are just able to, when we see fit, 
um, that a, an appointee, a sub, comes into the building and doesn't fit with what a teacher is asking them to do or is not interacting with the student appropriately, all we do is make a call to the county and they take care of all of those administrative issues. So there is a large administrative uh, savings to that piece alone. So, so generally, is the analysis going to be why we had an extraordinary amount of expense with substitute teachers the last quarter? Is that what you're suggesting? Is, is that what it's just, it, it was higher than, than anticipated, um, but it takes a while to analyze why. I mean, and what, you know, was it professional development? Were people being off? We don't know. I, I honestly don't know yet why they were increased you know, beyond what I expected them to be. That is true. Because of the few, we'll find that we have some um, subs for SLOs, um, which are the student learning objectives. Um, all teachers had to have those written by the end of the year in order to implement at the beginning of next year. Um, we have a great deal of subs. And for those reasons, um, I do not believe, I, I looked at it casually, but if you'd like me to go into more depth, that we did not have a larger ratio of teachers taking off this last quarter of this year compared to other, other years. And the SLOs are linked to a state mandated initiative? Correct. Thank you. So generally though, we, from the previous, I guess I, where my confusion got to June 30th, So I, I appreciate the explanation. I think I understand better. Um, but we actually had an $8 million projected uh, year end of June 30th, correct? For the current, for the previous actual budget? The, or, or is your policy going to be, uh, my understanding of the policy going forward, is that when the May, it doesn't become, begin July 1, it, become, it begins immediately? Because this is a June 30th closing, correct? Right. We closed June 30th. The five year from May reflected us having. 11,070,644 left as our cash balance, and it was $287,000 different than that projection, which if you look at it in the relation of our entire general fund budget, it was less than 0.16% different. So there's, it's never gonna be exact. Um, it's actually, if you take the 54, nine, so 55,000 for catastrophic costs off of that, then it's about $230,000 different. Um, like I said, you know, I'm going to be looking at the expenses and hopefully going forward, especially with some of the, with the waiver days, that will also help um, for professional development and the, and the not need of subs because we'll have those designated days for professional development, which will, hopefully we're planning on having that decrease our sub costs from that as well. So, I, because of the waiver days, that's okay. yeah. So, going forward, I actually anticipate the sub costs going down but until I can get a full quarter picture in the new year, it's going to be tough to say because they only goes <coughs> quarterly. I guess my my, my uh, operational question is a little bit different, which I understand, mm -hmm. is that the last two years I've been here, and, and I, I usually the, the the last column was from the previous approved from the budget that yeah versus updating it in May okay. so that we can actually I don't, I don't mind it being this way it just I think you had a two million dollar gain over what was projected. right that's all I'm so the previous to. five year from October would have been off almost two million so yeah, no, to a positive side to a good side right that's what I was trying so, to get to so the budget for the year which well ended, in theory the no the that's incorrect the, the five year forecast showed us having less money at the end of this school year than we do have in the May forecast in the actual we actually have more money than we anticipated. Less money from the May update, but from the October approved five year, we actually are have more money than we thought we were gonna have. So, so the way I'm trying to view July 1 for you mm -hmm. and for me to understand, when we go for the next fiscal year for 12 months, mm -hmm. the, the budget that was established and the work that everybody did to lay it Mm -hmm. So, so I, I would expect that you will be managing to to try to keep those costs down. Well, to, to just to go. keep keep How? it in that budget, whatever Absolutely. the number is. To keep in mind. And, and so, through June thirtieth, we would have an examination of that for the next fiscal year. I, yes. I, my surprise is the May yes. update here, creating this document for fiscal year. That's all. Right. 
I do have a fiscal year end financial report that kind of lists the different um, areas uh, that were increased and decreased, and that's something I was going to present at the last meeting, but I, I just completed it um, after the close. So um, that will be something that will go on probably the work session for the first of August. Okay. And then we can kind of. Um, I'm just trying to gauge because I, I, I thought we had a better projection here, and, and I didn't realize we were starting $300,000 down. Here, so. Well, so. actually, yeah. I mean, the, some of the revenue came in later. Late. Right, right. So, I, I mean, it's, it's just a cash flow. I mean, okay. it's, right. we're not really that far under. Like I said, it's 0.16% difference. So we're, we're pretty good on track. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much for the report. For sure. Oh. We have a motion to so we'll roll call. Do we have a motion? We, we have haven't had a motion yet. Is there a second? Um, Paterni? Uh, yes. Regano? Yes. Stuckey? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Okay. We're on item 3.2 approval of the five year forecast consulting agreement. Comments? <clears throat> um, this is um, a continuation of the um, five year forecasting consultant agreement and software that was approved several months ago, and this is just an updated renewal of that contract. As I recall, I think you said back there that would be. It would be a continuing, yes. Years. They do it by a year to year basis, yeah. so I did it from when I had asked till the end of the year and then updated for a new. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I have the same discussion question I had last year, and I know we've had a debate on this. I'm not challenging their value. But the contract is with OSBA, but the service delivery is with another provider. And I feel like, for public record purposes, that we should have an understanding of what is being paid to the provider who's delivering the services because they're the subcontractee. And I, I feel like we're, we're, we're being, the, the public is being, um, I feel like there's just a veil here between this because the provider who is delivering the service, who's providing the benefit, who's doing all the work, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's really not engaged with us yet. They work for us and there's no disclosure on the agreement between the OSDA and them for their services for us. So, I really want to reiterate again, I'd like to see that agreement. I, I understand your position previously, you don't think it's any of our business, but these are public funds. I actually never said it was any of your business. What I said was um, that um, PFR is a company who provides consulting and financial resources to districts, and they are not lawyers and legal people, so they have actually partnered with OSBA for OSBA to handle the legal side and the contract side, but the only party that we have anything to do with on our end is, oh, it is PFR. So, I mean, it, to me, I, I don't know, I'm not sure what the, the issue is. The, all of our services are coming strictly with PFR. Who they choose to have do their billing and, and, and is really, Feel irrelevant. I mean, I, you know, I don't understand what right. that issue is. Right. The, the issue is for, for me and the public is to know what the markup is from OSBA services to the delivery one. And it's zero. Well, they did say it was zero, and I had responded to that. They said there was no markup at all. I, I think there's a, if there's no markup, then I don't understand the reluctance of providing the agreement with the provider. So I, I'll stop it's there. It's a legal matter. It's just legalities of not being contracted people, they are finance people, so they revert that process for, you know, them. I'm not, I'm not doubting their, their work or their capabilities, I'm just looking for transparency. That's no, I, I guess I don't want to labor, but I, I would just say that it, it is a little bit unorthodox when you, when you hire a company to do a service, but you end up contracting with a different party. Normally, when you hire a company to do a service, if they need accounting help or 
or legal help, they would hire a consultant on their own, pay their consultant to do whatever, hand them, you know, the, the legal firm, just like we do. If we need a contract, our legal firm would draft that for us, it would give it to us, and we would execute it. I think that's where the confusion comes from, because it's, it, it frankly is, I find it to be kind of unorthodox. I, I just frankly don't feel it's confusing. I, I feel we're, we're going through the same process we went through last fall when we discussed this, or fall, when in the first place. Um, I, I feel that while we may not agree with the format that this company uses, we understand what that format is. And this is the structure that they are using with us. And my understanding is with many other school districts throughout Ohio, um, I mean, again, I, I, I can respect that this may not be the way we're used to, but this is the way that it is. And, and I, I just feel it's kind of pointless to continue to belabor the point about their method uh, of operation. Um, and that's just where I feel is, I feel that this discussion is just kind of a rehashing of the discussion we had um, in, uh, in, in January, February, where we just discussed this in the first place. Absolutely was my opening remarks, Dr. Malone. My position hasn't changed. I assume the service is great. I think there's a lack of transparency with the OSBA well, and 300 districts yeah, across the state. I, I disagree with, with the transparency, but again, um, what Peanut said. Well, I think we're all in agreement with the quality of work. Suffices and according to our treasurer, it's sufficient for our needs in the district. So. With that, roll call. Um, Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Paterni? No, for the same reasons as last year, not because of their service, but because of the lack of transparency with the agreement and with our district. Yes. Yes. Motion passed. Motion passes. Item 3.3, Springboro CCSD 2014. I thought exactly. Yeah. COPS resolution. Um, Ms. Floyd, if I may, uh, there's been so much discussion about this uh, before anything is brought to a vote for you. I would like John Ford and Todd Smith, who's going to be the contract, to come forward. I think we need to ask some of these questions. We want to talk transparency. I think we just need to get things out in the open and have a discussion about this particular contract. So, John and Todd, if you could come up, perhaps one of you to the microphone, that would be great. I would like to say, on for the record, if you could add this into the record, we did go through a process um, where uh, there were five different companies interviewed. Mr. Pennell, who's new to the district, did the legwork of taking care of these things. That's what he's done in the past. One of the first that I've done. Um, when we went through this, uh, Mr. Smith was selected for three reasons. Number one, he clearly had the best price in terms of what it would do for the district. Um, number two, the trust factor. He, is the, he has been on committees in this district since 1997. He's had his kids come to this school district. He has had contracts approved by board members who are already here from the work that he's done in the past, which meant a lot to me. Um, and quite frankly, I was able to call the previous administration to ask, how was the job? Well, we're spending $5 million of taxpayer money. I built 11 homes. And one thing I understand is, is when you hire someone to do a subcontracting service, you need to make sure that you're getting your money's worth. Most of the companies want us to purchase their products in addition to their services. We are not pur purchasing anything from Trimco, who supposedly is under a lawsuit. We are working with weatherproofing technologies, and they are providing the contract work for us. We have a say in what we pay and what we purchase. So to me, from a financial standpoint, this absolutely was the direction that we needed to go. And looking at past practices, um, we had nothing here but, uh, but a trust factor with him that I felt, from my position of my recommendation, was the direction that we needed to go. But with that said, there's been multiple comments um, about the process. And I would like, uh, first of all, if we have questions, we could ask those. And John and Todd will be happy to answer those. Uh, otherwise, John can walk us through the process. If the, board so chooses uh, because we, I do think we need to have some discussions about this. Email is not a good way to discuss those. First off, do we want John to walk through it or do you want to just ask questions? Uh, Mr. Anderson, I think uh, you know the matter was referred to our attorney. I think our attorney summarized the issue for us. 
um, I don't need to hear a walkthrough again. If somebody else would, I, I'm certainly willing to defer to, to that. But I don't think uh, we need to do that. I mean, for folks uh, who, who might not be aware of the issue, was it, uh, was it our last meeting or maybe the meeting before uh, an issue came before the board where uh, we were presented an opportunity to to engage in an energy efficiency project. Uh, Mr. Pinnell had gone out uh, and sought uh, firms to do that. Um, uh, we had uh, five or six firms respond with proposals. Uh, one of those firms was the firm that Mr. Smith is representing. Um, the issue came about because Mr. Smith is also an appointee on our budget finance committee and then there were discussions in the Budget Finance Committee, I believe, prior to the decision to make this award. And so the question came up, is there a conflict of interest there? Uh, that issue was referred to our attorney. Uh, he uh, wrote back to us, I guess, in, in uh, rather lengthy uh, legal analysis that I uh, can't go through off the top of my head. But uh, the crux of the issue came down to uh, is, there, is there a conflict of interest because Mr. Smith, by virtue of being appointed to the Budget Finance Committee, is he a, uh, a public official under the terms of the law? And the, attorney, or the board's attorney said that uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, he, in our attorney's opinion, he was not a public official under the terms of the law. If he had been, if he is a public official under the terms of life, it probably, I might gather, unless it probably would have been a conflict of interest in this situation. Our attorney, the board's attorney, felt that it was not, he was not a public official in this circumstance. And so the attorney's opinion is that there is no conflict of interest. I guess I saw an email traffic today that somehow the Ethics Commission has gotten engaged, and so I guess we'll get still another opinion from the Ethics Commission on it. Yes, there was an anonymous letter sent uh, to the uh, Ethics Commission. But nonetheless, we bring up discussions. Uh, I mean, when we do business with in a company, that company also could hold us liable as well. So before we make the statement, there were discussions beforehand. I think we need to define what those discussions were because those weren't discussions about specifications. Those weren't discussions about any pricing. There were two contracts given to people and said, tell us your thoughts. And in one of the meetings, the person wasn't there. So I guess what I would like Mr. Pinnell to do is to somewhat walk through what happened in these meetings because I will tell you, from my standpoint, um, I'm not appreciative of the comments. And the things that we've discussed uh, on email, the comments made, and, and because Mr. You know, Mr. Smith is here, the last time, I mean, four of you have worked with him in your careers. And Mr. Organa, you've been a board member before. He's been on budget and finance since 1997. I mean, when I look forward, I want to buy robots from Moto Man. Roger Christensen, who is an outstanding businessman, is on our mission and vision, and we are working with him. Part of business is building relationships. So every time we go to buy something, if it's going to turn into a question because of perhaps their political affiliation from the past, it becomes very difficult because it puts the district in a position for these businesses to come back on us. So with that said, I would like to have some discussion and John to walk through what was discussed in the budget finance meetings. The, the information that was presented at budget finance meetings were the same information that was presented in work session at about the same time that the budget finance meetings were going on. Uh, the only thing that was different was the very last budget finance meeting that occurred before the June 3rd board meeting, I presented both Proposals. I made copies for everyone there and passed those out and asked people to look at them. I went over them and we had some comments from uh, Mr. Petrie and some comments from a couple of the other folks that were there. Mr. Smith made sure that he did not make any comments during that meeting, uh, during that part of the meeting. Um, and then it was a, our recommendation was that we would select him basically we asked if anybody had any other opinions about what else we should select yeah, besides him. So uh, the consensus of the group that, that we would come forward with the WTI um, rep proposal and 
recommend that to the board, and that's what we did the very next, the June 3rd board meeting. So with that, unless there's anything I think of. I'd just like to, uh, to mention that I also am a member of that Budget and Finance Committee and, and attended the various meetings which are in, in, in question here. And uh, I, I would agree you know, completely with what uh, Mr. Pinnell has said. Uh, there, there were discussions. There were opportunities for various members to voice their, their feelings on this whole process. Um, was anything inappropriate said or done that in any way could have benefited uh, Mr. Smith? Uh, no, there was not. And uh, I, I, I feel 100% comfortable with the decision that the board as a whole made that it was the correct decision uh, ethics free uh, with uh, as far as uh, picking the uh, the tremco company and, and uh, mr smith uh, and i'm also bothered by the fact that this process has uh, gone on in email uh, I, i'm bothered by the fact that that uh, it has made its way to the ethics commission anonymously I, frankly, I don't know the workings of the Ethics Commission, but I'm very surprised that they would even take into consideration an anonymous complaint. But uh, it's like uh, that, that someone has, a, has an ulterior motive here that uh, come one way or the other, ultimately, we're going to derail this project. And, uh, and, and frankly, that, that's, that's quite bothersome to me. <clears throat> Well, I would like to add, uh, in terms of transparency, if anyone in the community would like to meet and discuss these, I would be happy to. I think by the time we get finished talking about the financing tonight, you'll see that it's actually a, a very good deal uh, to be able to do these things. I mean, we have two options uh, when we need repairs done throughout the district. Last year, we had someone fall through one of our roofs, and his elbow is still shattered from that because it had not been worked on in years. We we're trying to repair things in the district uh, at the cost of $5 million. We, don't, we do not have $5 million to fall back on. The only option we would have is our personal improvement levy, which is not an option we want to do. It has a guaranteed payback to where this should be a very beneficial um, function for this district. So if anyone would like to meet, I'd be happy to set a meeting with the community and go over this in great detail. It is the community's money. It's not the board's money. It's not my money. It is the, the, the taxpayer's money, and it's being spent very wisely on our facilities to keep those up to date and safe for our students. I do have a couple questions. Uh, one, uh, I don't know who the anonymous person is, but don't point at me. So just for the record, we'll let's, just make, let's just make sure that's clear for the record. But uh, I'm trying to understand the uh, the debt structure here. We have $123 million of outstanding investments, <coughs> and it seems like there's a um, opportunity uh, that creates a false sense of obligation that is not defined as debt or maybe a, an obli a obligation that is debt. Can you explain this, uh, Mr. Smith, as to what this debt structure is and, and, and how your company is going to be guaranteeing that it's not an obligation of the district for what appears to be in excess of 20 years? I believe that's the conditions that are there. Well, that's well more, actually, it's more. actually, um, David Conley from Rothmill Financial um, is here tonight. He is acting as our financial advisor on this transaction. Um, so I would like him to come up and he has a couple brief things he would like to show based on the um, financial structure, the terms, the guarantee, um, and how it all works. Um, he has worked um, with over 120 school districts. He worked with Springboro as well back in 2004 um, on a $61 million project. He's worked on many projects from the district I came from, so he's uh, outstanding at this, and he'll be able to give you some light on some of these questions. So, so, so the real question I have, because I deal with tax exempt transactions, is how is this not a, who is guaranteeing, is Mr. Smith's company guaranteeing this debt, or is Springboro Sports guaranteeing this debt? The, uh, so this lease. So this yeah, lease. So, yeah, there's, so there's two separate. Um, uh, there's two separate points to your to your question. There's a guarantee that Mr. Smith's company will have their for this His company uh, will be providing some type of a guarantee, which I haven't reviewed, but uh, is common in the industry related to energy projects. That guarantee makes a promise that says that. 
the energy improvements that are made to the district should produce a savings of X. If those savings don't occur, his company will make up the shortfall. So let's just say for the sake of an example, the savings is supposed to be $350,000 a year. It turns out the savings is only $300,000 a year. Their company would then pay you $50,000 to offset the differential. So there's a promise and a guarantee that the savings would be a certain amount of money every single year. That guarantee from his company is separate from any commitment that the school district makes from the financing. So they're, they're not committed. So his guarantee is not pledged as any type of a collateral to the financing. Uh, so that's that's part A to the question. Let me also take a step back. Our, my job, I represent the school district as your financial representative. We have a legal obligation under the Securities Exchange Commission uh, following the financial markets meltdown to protect the interests of the school district. So when you enter into a new financing structure, uh, it's recommended that you have an expert make sure that those financing structures are appropriate for the district and for the taxpayers. So I've been retained, or at least will be tonight, if things move forward in this particular capacity, uh, to represent you. I have a fiduciary responsibility to be frank and honest and tell you what I think is in your best interest based on the goals of the district. Uh, as I understand the goal so far, the first is to move forward with this project relatively quickly uh, because there are some very important aspects to it. The second is to try to do the transaction where the interest cost associated with it is as low as possible uh, because this is a very interest rate sensitive financing, meaning that as interest rates change on you, uh, the cost of the project goes up and could in fact go up beyond the estimate of the savings from the energy improvements and the guarantee. Uh, and so if that were to happen, the question is whether or not the district would want to subsidize the difference between those two things. Today, the interest rates are low enough where the projected payments on the financing, and I'll get to the financing structure in just a second, where the payments on the financing, including the interest, uh, would be met by the projected savings from the energy improvements and or the guarantee, whichever would kick in. So it's my job to sort of analyze what options you have from a financing perspective, assuming you want to proceed with the project. Uh, so we've done that. We've looked at which options are available to the district to finance the project. Uh, the first is, of course, to use cash. And uh, a $5 million project would require $5 million to cash. Uh, the district would has the ability to pay cash, but it would, it would deplete all of the district's cash and make it very difficult to operate the district. From our perspective, I wouldn't recommend that as, a, as an option at this time. Uh, in the future, as uh, the district continues to grow, revenues come in, we will structure the financing that if you would like to pay it off sooner with cash reserves that are built up over time, uh, you can do that. The second option is to borrow money to issue debt. Uh, Ohio law is very strict and very clear about a school district's ability to issue debt or to borrow money. Uh, law says that you can borrow one-tenth of 1% 1 of your assessed valuation without a vote of the taxpayers. And that's it. Uh, that, that number equals $980,000 approximately. So you think of it this way, the school district has a credit card that's pre-approved for $980,000. Clearly not enough for us to finance this particular project. The other choice is to put a bond issue on the ballot uh, that would allow you to borrow $5 million with voter approval. Uh, that doesn't match with the goal of trying to move the project forward as quickly as possible. The third choice is to use an exemption in the law that allows you to spend, uh, to, to issue a bond issue or issue debt for the purposes of energy conservation. Uh, the school district has $8 million available to it under that exemption. Uh, the exemption requires that you submit a proposal to the state of Ohio uh, that demonstrates that the energy conservation project in fact pays for itself. Uh, that state, the state takes about 60 days to get the <coughs> approval for that particular project. The two problems with that course of action is that first, this project is, is broader than energy conservation projects. It includes roofing, it includes paving, and other things. So that would not be allowed under the state program. The second part is that the state program uh, only lets you finance those improvements over a 15-year period, uh, a 15-year payback on this type of transaction would probably exceed the annual savings that's projected by the energy company. 
uh, and thus you would have to subsidize the difference between the two. Uh, so based on those two issues, we think that using the House Bill 264, the energy exemption, still don't quite well match up with the, the need to move the project forward. Mr. That leaves us with the third option. Can I ask you one question just for clarification? Yes. Can you go back to what you just said about the subsidy in the 15 years? I'm not sure I understood what that means. The, the current? The last option we're discussing. Yeah, the current estimate of savings from the energy improvements uh, would be about, about $394,000 a year. Uh, $394,000 a year amortized over 15 years will not pay back $5 million. So the district would have to contribute additional money from the general fund to make a higher payment every year. So as a goal, we wanted to try to keep the payment on the debt equal to or less than the projected savings so that, in essence, there's no additional money. So is the reason being that the useful life of some of those items, why that 15-year cap is there, is not so, for instance, a light bulb, I mean, it doesn't have a 15-year useful life, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the original, I, I'm now old enough to where I actually did one of the very first energy conservation financings in the state. The program originally, for that very reason, only had a 15-year life because the, the, the primary types of improvements were, that were made were short-lived short, short -lived assets, uh, mostly lighting and fixtures of that nature. But since that time, you've seen the boilers and things that have a much longer life expectancy in these things. Uh, and so, so now it's reasonable to look at a slightly longer lifespan than 15 years. And we've looked at the, the, the life estimates on this. We think the projections that are provided by the company are, are reasonable uh, from that perspective. So our goal is to really have a financing term where the payment on the financing is in line with what the, the, the TRIPCO is projecting as savings so that it, it's a wash. In essence, you pick up roof projects and the paving and the energy work without spending any more money than you spent last year to operate the school district. So, so, so a technical question, which maybe it's too deep, but we spend, let's do it for now. We spend on energy that this program would be related to 300, 400. Approximately 1.4 million dollars a year. So, so if we don't spend more than 1.4 million dollars the theory is we should be spending 1.1 million dollars after we do this project. Is that is that is that is that correct? Or is that well, no. Probably should be one million dollars. Right. That's correct. Sure. And 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 the guarantor, the balance sheet of the guarantor, which is your company, Mr. Smith. Yes. Is that Tremco or is that some other company? That's Weatherproof. Weatherproof. Which, which is which is owned by Tremco or a subsidiary? Yes. So the balance sheet is underwritten by you, Mr. Connolly. No. So when you say the balance sheet. As it relates to the guarantee in case we need a $300,000 check in year seven. No, our, our responsibility is to evaluate the financing options that you have and just provide you advice and guidance about those financing options. Okay. So the, the guarantee, so when you talk about the, the balance sheet and the guarantee, that's strictly <coughs> the energy consultant. So they're, they will be extending to you a contract that says that they guarantee the savings to be 400000 a year. Or, or something close to that. Assuming that's a good guarantee, how does that get evaluated? Who evaluates that on our behalf? That is done by the energy company on an annual basis, correct? Right? And these contracts have been used for 30 years since 1985. Yeah, maybe I'm not being... blessed by the state. Yeah, maybe I'm not being specific. I apologize. Um, so if we have in year seven a $1.7 million expense and does the guarantee exclude the cost of natural gas and whatnot that happened to spike that year because it is outside of the equipment's control and therefore that's an exclusion in the guarantee? Or I'm concerned about voting for this tonight without some of that information. I don't see that here. I'm not trying to delay this or stall it. I'm trying to understand who's, where the financial expert is that's underwriting the language of the guarantee and the balance sheet of the guarantor. Because obviously we're guaranteeing the debt as a district with a double A or whatever our rating is, right? right. Think, yeah, we'll go out. I think he should, I agree. I think we should address the guarantee and how that works, and then I'll talk about the, the finance. Thank you. Thank you. Anything commodity related is, is adjusted. So if your gas costs, just like you say, go up, then the cost of the unit of gas is going to go up, right? If you have a spike. Sure. 
Okay, so that's an that's exclusion. Yeah, sure. That's an exclusion. So how do you balance? So, so everything is based on consumption because that's what the school district can control is how things are used and operated. So that's what you base on. It's based on consumption. Kilowatt hours, each use of gas. So really, and I'm just trying to understand, so the exclusions, because typically energy costs go up, really somewhat carve out the fact that there's a 100% chance that our utility and our whatever cost this is going to look at this, we've got lighting, we've got some uh, HVAC things, we've got some ventilation, we've got some uh, retro commissioning, some water meters, some kitchen boosters, and some chillers, which may have some good savings. But the bottom line is, if the utility and natural gas goes up, you're setting a baseline for your guarantee today, and in year 18, that baseline has a somewhat of an escalator of some percent that we have to agree to? No, there's no escalation. There's no escalation. So no, so I don't do that, and our company doesn't do that. So actually, if your cost of energy goes up, the savings to the district will almost triple. In theory. No, not in theory, in, the, in actual practice. If the equipment has got a useful life that works that long, and the efficiency is something like that. So my question to you is, some of the stuff that's on there, how long do windows last? How old are the windows at Fair Creek? I don't know when these built, sir. You're asking the question. <laughs> how, about, how about the roofs at Fair Creek and Spring Road and Intermediate? And the chillers at uh, Intermediate? We're dealing with stuff that's well over 25 years of useful life. Sure. Well, we had a couple go this year. But that's Whether they related they, under frozen. They could have been 20 years, yeah, whatever the was. It's, I, I guess I'm trying to understand really the value of the, of the company's guarantee, not your guarantee, but of any guarantee of this, because you know we have discussions about this is similar to uh, CareFlight, and there are some challenge, some small challenges right now about that passive that are going on that we're working through, and what I don't understand is how how we will manage the analysis and the valuation of your guarantee over what equates to I think a 20-year. Is it 20 year term, Mr. Right. Yeah, it's 20. It was 20. Mm -hmm. So, so I won't be here, you know, whatever time, six years, four years, two years, as it relates to paying attention to this. But I'm just trying to figure out where that, how that plays into this analysis, and should we, how do we evaluate that as a board, and as really, is it really a zero neutral cost to us? And I, I don't know how to see that. In, well, we did this, and I think. Mr. Regano, you were here. Oh, no, no, I'll do that. No. Sorry. Uh, when we did two other previous contracts, and I wasn't with this company at that time. This is my third one to district. So they've all been very successful. In fact, the last one, we've saved a million dollars on our construction project for all the schools. So it's been done. This is the third one here that I've been directly involved with. So what, you're, what you just said, if I understand that correctly, is that you can, which I, I did not know, Obviously, it's not my history here. So what you're saying is that you can provide the data on a similar project that your company has done that demonstrated a guaranteed savings and that this is the taxpayers for hands of their The last one I can reference for you is I did Kansas City Schools. Uh, we projected a million dollars, uh, sorry, 600,000 savings. They saved a million. So, so, and that's documented in the state of Iowa. <coughs> no, I'm just trying to, like, I was just trying to follow up what you just said. I apologize. I, I was just tracking with you. That's all. Awesome. Um, I thought you had said there was data here that we could look at some project. Here. All kinds. Of, we, we got data. We could absolutely go through any one of those data if you like. How it's done. So, so um, Mr. Connolly, or well, that, Mr. Smith, do we negotiate with our lawyers with you for the guarantee, or how does that happen? Where, where does that come in this? Where does, does Mr. Petrie do that negotiation for the guarantee language, or is it just a standard document? Uh, you, do you know that, um, David? Is will Tom Wilson, our um, bond counsel, will he then look over the guarantee paperwork and all that stuff and make sure the legality of the guarantee and all that stuff? Yeah, that? I mean, he he can review the, le the legal contract of, of 
the guarantee. But I mean, your points are very good points. The guarantee, there's still there has to be a determination from the board's perspective that the guarantee is worth the paper that it's written on. And uh, so that's a very honest position to take on it because you're depending on them if the savings isn't there to pay you money. And in the event that they don't have the financial wherewithal to do that, then obviously you have an, you have an issue. Uh, so the attorney can obviously make sure the guarantee is legally binding, but to the extent the company can pay is not that attorney's responsibility. That's a responsibility of the district to the extent that you can actually ascertain that. Our recommendation would be is that you look at that obligation on this company like you would any other vendor that you're doing services with. Uh, I'm sure that that particular company is in good standing with the DAE and others and has a reputation. Um, so there's a process that you can go through to, to verify that it is a company of, in good standing with other of its uh, clients that they serve. I mean, I would, I would establish, if I were in your shoes and Tara, I could advise Tara on establishing at least some primary protocol. But it is impossible to say that this particular company will or won't be in business five years from now. I mean, that's, you can't say that about uh, why you see Bear Stearns and Shibuya and labor problems. Uh, we, we don't know what the future holds, which is one of the reasons when I talk about the financing structure, you'll hear me uh, talk about why a 20-year amortization is a smarter choice in the event the guarantee isn't there five years from now or some other thing happens from a cash flow perspective. Uh, there is a limit to the, your ability to assure they can deliver on their guarantee. You just have to be honest about that. Uh, we, we, there's, I bought, a, I bought a car once that had a guarantee on it and it wasn't worth, worth much. But you go into these things with your eyes open, you do your homework the best that you can, you rely on the experts that you have to represent you to give you the, the best guidance in it, and then you make a decision, such as hiring a company that's reputable. Uh, and I, you know, I think that you've probably followed most of those steps so far. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I derailed your conversation. So you went from the debt piece to the lease piece. So right now in this lease piece, which doesn't look like that, doesn't Correct. count against us, doesn't doesn't require us to go to a vote, doesn't require a super majority vote of the board. That's correct. And it's really debt that we're guaranteeing, but it doesn't, where does it, sh That's it shows correct. up somewhere in our balance sheet, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So the so we ended up with this third option to finance the improvement. The option is a lease purchase option. School districts use lease purchase financing most, <coughs> most frequently for school buses. Uh, larger school districts use them for, for copiers. Uh, it is a common financing instrument in most governments other than school districts for facility improvements. So that's why this is important that we take the time to go through this discussion. And I want to make sure the board asks as many questions as they can because it is an uncommon financing structure for this amount of money for this type of project for a school district. Uh, given that the other two options of financing using cash and using debt are the least attractive. The least purchase financing is the one that provides at least the terms and the options that make the most sense. The first is that it allows you to get the money to move forward in the next 60 days. So that's number one. Number two, it allows us to do that and capture current interest rates. And I, want, I actually brought some things to, are, are we, uh, this gentleman standing next to me is a distraction. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was a quarterback, and any time I have a shadow over my left shoulder, it brings back That's really bad memory. Uh, <laughs> <a> big shadow. <laughs> I don't know if you want to let him. <laughs> I have some things I'd like to hand out if you all are willing to. Uh, yeah, the, the, I, I guess I'm, I'm fine. I, I, the only thing I, I deal with every day is liquidity covenants and net right. worth covenants and things like that, and I guess I'm not familiar. Standard language aside. Right. I just want to make sure I understood the last comment you made, Mr. Cummings. You said this is uncommon financing for five million. This is common. Yes. It is uncommon. It is not a, a regular financing instrument. Uh, when I and I and I make that statement relative to how schools generally finance uh, major capital improvements. But I, I understand. That. Yeah, it is becoming more common. However. Uh, so a lease purchase is no, it really isn't an attempt to do an off balance sheet transaction, which you know in our industries, and I know you and I share very similar backgrounds, uh, companies and corporations would sometimes approach this type of a financing as a way of hiding debt. 
uh, this is a this is an approach that allows you to to borrow money when it's very difficult to issue debt. So it's a it's a alternative to a challenging way to go about doing what you need to do. Uh, it is in fact a true lease, meaning as a lease, the board can cancel and walk away from it on an annual basis. So it's subject to your appropriation as you do the appropriations process on an annual basis. That's the legal side of it. The practical side, however, is totally different because if you do decide to walk away from your lease obligation, you give the leaseholder, the trust bank in this case, the authority to take control of your school buildings. And in the worst case scenario, they can padlock the school buildings and have the children standing out looking at the buildings and waving. Um, so it's a, you have the obligation to walk away, but, it, but the punishment for doing so is pretty severe. Uh, so it's very, it's, it's frankly impossible to walk away, uh, even though you have the legal right to walk away. Why is that important? The appropriation, the, the legal right to walk away is important because it is, as such, it does not constitute debt. It's, you're not obligated to pay. It's just that someone stands there with a gun to your head and says you're going to pay. And so that's what this transaction is. It's a non-debt debt instrument. Uh, that requires that you pay, and if you don't, your facilities are turned over to be operated by a party that is not in your control. Um, and But if you think about it, even if you issue debt, you would still have the same burden, so to speak, the moral obligation to pay. So it's really no different than a debt obligation. It does not count against your debt authority, but the rating agencies will count it against your debt authority. So, uh, they will look at it as a guarantee, as an obligation that you would have to pay. It will be, uh, it's payable from any any revenue source that's available to the district, and as we've mentioned, it is uh, payable from the projected savings from the improvements that are to be made. And to the extent the savings aren't there, a guarantee that would be provided by the uh, company. So I do have. There's lots of language that goes along with creating uh, these these purchase transactions. The resolution that you have before you tonight steps through those documents. If you're interested, I have a presentation that takes us through those documents, 15 minutes at the most, uh, that will give you a complete understanding of the legal arrangement between the, the parties that are involved so that you have comfort, or if you have enough comfort to proceed now, that's fine. I can, I can handle this either way. I'm mindful of your time, and I don't, I'm not sure we want to. It's, it's your call. I like this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> for, for me it's a long time, but I think you know it would be good maybe if we had that discussion possibly prior to this being put on. I, I realize there's timing issues. I don't know what a week extra is or two weeks extra is. Plus, there's other considerations that are out there right now that, that does raise a little bit of a flag for me personally uh, to to uh, address until the uh, legal opinion side, not knowing uh, what else is uh, out there. That's for me, but I speak for one, so. Um, I, I would like to go through the presentation, uh, if not tonight, at, at some other time. Um, because at, at this point, it sounds like we're handing the keys over to somebody for our entire school district, and I guess I need to understand that. <coughs> so I'd like to say that when I took this job, and Mr. Pinnell could attest, budget finance was researching the exact same plan, but it was with a different company. And that's one of the reasons John carried forward with this. Would that be accurate, Mr. Pinnell? Or, 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 actually, I was there. Let me be more specific. Uh, the conversations on that product was that the energy saving calculations dealing with the useful life were somewhat exaggerated, and that's why there was one reason why we didn't proceed with it, was because we weren't confident that the analysis, but you are correct. There was a presentation by an engineering company. I'm not certain if you were I was in that meeting or not that meeting, as yeah. well. And, and we might have lost a treasure at that time too, but yeah. also probably put a little bit of a delay. But the conversations from my perspective, which are the same today, um, you know, we built a budget around managing our resources to address a majority, some of these items, not all these items. And, and so my concern, and we did that because I was concerned at the time, personally, of, my, of the debt rating that our district had, which is why we went out to the s and and tried to get that fixed. Um, I was concerned, and, and actually, to Ms. Floyd's credit, 
um, brought up the fact that we have $120 million about saving debt. We had Moody's people tell us that our ratios were close and things like that. So we tried to do in budget things that were managed through our existing resources. But you are correct. There was a presentation, and it was uh, a broader conversation just saying, hey, it was here. So I'm not trying to derail it. I'm just trying to give you the, the facts of where I was at the time. But in terms of this, I mean, we're looking at worst case scenario, catastrophic scenario. What are our options if we do not go with this, other than a cash option, which we cannot afford? Well, we, according to the big budget that I saw a while ago, we had 3.7 million of this 5 million. We had 3.7 million, whether it's of this 5 million, built into a managed strategy. If that strategy didn't work, your catastrophic answer is, you go out and have to dig deeper into reserves, obviously. And that's a, that was the last budget that I mm -hmm. saw and was comfortable with that we were managing our revenue to our expenses in a way. So that, that's my answer to your question. It may not be the right answer, that's just my answer. But my response, when I'm looking at this, because we have looked at it, we would have to deplete all of our reserves to be able to even try to fund something like this. When 87% of our, and I will go on record as saying this, and I'm proud to say it, 87% of our cost is to staff benefits and staff salaries. If we're unable to support that, that is our core business. So, I mean, clearly we would deplete all of our funds, which would leave none for staff, which would leave us a couple options. Give nothing, reduce, and or go for another level. Districts do these types of things to be able to make things stretch just like the done business. Right. I, I don't disagree with you, Mr. Petrie. I, I think what was interesting from Ms. Floyd, the district she came from, they had 30 million in debt. We got 123 million in debt. That's all. And so we have revenue. You know, we don't have a revenue problem in the district that I can tell. So and we may have, and who knows what's going to happen with future revenue sources and things like that. But you know, to the extent that we can debate this all night, we have a different philosophy of just going more into debt. On, on something of immediacy versus managing those resources. That's, again, where I spent the last two years trying to move things forward towards and try to, just like the buses, we didn't go out a 15-year lease. We went out with a five-year program because we knew we had the resources to cover $230,000 or $240,000 a year to do it. And we knew that the useful life of the bus would be, um, you know, 15 years, and we'd own the buses, and, and that was something we didn't spread it out take the cost and we manage it. So those are just some of the same philosophies. We have two current bus acquisitions, a lot of those full bus acquisitions, but currently financed for 30 years for buses. Two. Before my time. Before my time. I, I don't just, know, yeah, before my time. They were just a few years ago. And, I, and just in response to, I, well, I realize that Loveland has a lot less debt. Um, but that's also because they have a $5 million continuing PI levy that they have, which constitutes a, a lot of our, the way, you know, a lot of our buildings and, and improvements that we need to make all come from that continuing levy. That sure, I mean, just, why, when, when you say there's 30 year bus things, I don't know anything about that. I've been on the board since 2012. I didn't vote for a 30 year bus. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, okay. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be difficult. I just, oh, I no, I'm just saying there are some other, I understand what you're saying. Why don't you go ahead with, if it's yeah, I, 10 minute version? Sure, yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. Let me uh, make make a recommendation because there, I, I have a responsibility to do this and then you can evaluate um, where, where it all stands. From my perspective, I've seen and heard that the district needs a project and that it, Ultimately, it happens, whether it happens now or next year. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is an interest rate sensitive type of a situation. Every time the interest rates move, it either costs you or saves you money. Uh, every 10 basis points, that's 0.10% change, either saves or costs your general fund and your taxpayers $130,000. Uh, I just passed out a current chart that shows interest rates. This is the last 12 months. Uh, the interest rates, the, the, the solid line is, oh, it's on that solid line. Can you put forward a couple more pages for you? There you go. Uh, at the bottom, that represents the taxable interest rates, the rates that are affected in the treasury. And the solid area, those are tax exempt interest rates. Those are the interest rates that you would be financing this particular project at. Uh, many of you know that bad news 
tends to bring interest rates down. Bad, bad economic news, bad political news. Uh, we do not have any shortage of bad news today with the activities of uh, 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 Israel and, and the Ukraine and the BRIC Bank. Uh, it is likely in the next six weeks that we will see a further decline in interest rates, which is an opportune time if you were so inclined to borrow money to do so. Uh, I don't know if that will be long-lived, however. Uh, the market, the Fed is, is obviously going to start to ease back away from their quantitative easing. Interest rates will likely start to come back up again. But there might be a window of opportunity to make this project even more affordable if interest rates come down. Just a question. Your documents had a 6% rate. At least it was a draft document. Right. And is that a taxable tax exemption? That's a tax exemption rate. It's a not-to-exceed number that's kind of right. a plug number. Today, we're at 3.8%. And, and is that based on the 10, typically is that based on the 10-year treasury, which is about 250? On this particular financing, the 10-year treasury is a pretty good indicator of where uh, market movement, you can dig a little deeper and find municipal interest rates, which is how you'd be selling these securities and get, get a, it's just not as readily available as a treasury. I use the 10-year treasury as a benchmark. With a spread, so the spread we're looking at close to two, looks like 200 basis points. Right, somewhere around there would, okay. would, be, would be a good indicator. Okay. Uh, so, you know, 130 grand every time the interest rate moves 10 basis points is pretty important. Over the life of the project. Over the life of the project. So if you were to present value that number, that's probably 100, maybe 90 grand somewhere around there. Um, it's my job to advise you as to whether or not I think taking more time or less time is a better choice for you. Given the type of this project and all what we know, uh, I had a page up there in the last page um, that if you acted tonight to adopt a resolution to do the financing, regardless of who does the work, just the financing, sure. it takes eight weeks to get to the point where we lock in the interest rate. It, it takes eight weeks from any night that you adopt a resolution to do this project to get the financing done. It's so not an instant process. Yet. So when you say lock in the interest rate, that is for how long? That is for the 20 year, the 20 year term. So we have we have an eight week period of time from board action to to locking something in on, on this. So uh, so if we come back and meet at another board meeting, just start the clock from there. Um, so my thought is again, I think the sweet spot. I might be wrong. I don't I don't usually make predictions on interest rates, but I'm going to tell you something that feels really weird about what's going on. Uh, and I think we're going to see interest rates drop in the short term. Uh, and if we do, we can capture it. That only matters if this project's going to happen come hell or high water anyway, okay? So if, if you're committed, you know the project has to happen, we as well do it when it's most opportune to borrow the money to do it. So I want to show you that schedule. The first would be the authorization of the financing structure. We have to still put together a financing team to actually be an investment banker, which is why I exist, because Congress says you can't trust investment bankers and you need someone to represent you. Uh, we have to get the investment bankers on board. You have to get your offering prospectus because you're, you're creating the issuance of securities, uh, $5 million of, of legally traded securities. Uh, that's, that'll take us four weeks, and that's working our tails off to get it done. Then we have to meet with Moody's to secure your rating. That's, that's week number five. Get the rating in hand, and then we're able to sell the cops uh, on week six and close the, the cop. The cops is short for a certificate of participation, which is this lease instrument that is really a bond to lease. Uh, so eight weeks out, and that's moving at a very quick pace. Like what kind of rating do you get on this with these typically? It's usually one grade below your regular general obligation rating. So right now you're rated AA2, AA3, so this would be an A1 uh, Moody's rating. The, the, um, the five-year so that because we're at 20 year money, that's why the rate spread is so much over 10. Yeah. yeah. And so we can't get it, and because of the projected savings, we can't get it into a 15 year or a, a 10 year structure. Because you know, we, we, could, uh, we could try to move some of the principal more forward in the, in the amortization to get it you know, amortized. Right now, I'm using just a flat annual estimate to match the, the savings projections. If interest rates end up being another 10 or 15 basis points lower than we're estimating, I could shift more principal forward and then capture the value on 
the short, you know, short I, I'm afraid I, I don't want to get into too many buzzwords, but the short end of the yield curve, you can, you can capture some more value and that improves the overall okay. savings. Like an A-bond or B-bond. Right. right, so we could do it that way if we needed to. Uh, but again, that's if we if we that's if we get in the market while the market's right. Now, if the interest rate goes back up to where it was a year ago, then the conversation is a different conversation. Uh, so let's go back to page one. The lease purchase I mentioned is an uncommon financing structure for schools. Uh, that doesn't mean that it is a, a bad financing structure. It's only uncommon that the schools are a creature of habit. When you need a bond issue for a building. You, Historically, you put it on the ballot and the voters historically run away, yes. right? That was my whole point. Or you pass a PI levy and the PI levy brings in $5 million a year and you can right. take care of what you need to take care of. This is a different world. It's harder to pass bond issues. It's harder to pass PI levies. So school districts have to become more creative in using their current resources. We refer to it as reallocating resources. This particular financing is reallocating money that was once spent on maintenance of, of Roofs and roofs and, and, and parking lots and energy and dedicating it to paying a lease purchase. So, uh, school financing lease structures and nine steps. I tried to get it down to a short number. In essence, the way this works, uh, it's a lot easier than, than it sounds. Uh, you turn over your keys. Someone made a comment about turning the keys over to someone. The very step of this process is that you turn the keys over to a, a shell corporation. That shell corporation exists for a microsecond. Everything we're going to talk about happens in an instant. All transactions, all contracts, all agreements are executed simultaneously. So it's not uh, in a day's time. But the school district grants a lease to a shell corporation of the buildings and the land that's affected by the lease. And then uh, instantly, the second, the second step, that shell corporation returns those keys right back to you in a second, in a lease back. They lease back those properties to you for a lease payment of 350000 a year, which happens to equal the payment on the financing structure. So the payment is $350,000 a year to the Shell Corporation, correct? Right. 356. Right. Three, what was the? 356. 356. Out of our $57 million budget. That's correct. And I think the guarantee right now is at 394. That's so we're going to have a little surplus. So, and that's because interest rates are lower than, you know, as long as this trend continues, it's going to continue to be the payment lower than the guarantee. So the, instantly, the, the, you have a, you lease your facilities to a shell corporation, it immediately leases it back to you with a promise of you to pay in $356,000 a year. At that point, both you and the shell corporation assign all of your rights to both the initial lease and the lease back to a trust. And the trust takes control of the transaction. The trust then says, okay, I have a payment coming from the school district of $356,000 a year. I'm going to sell interests to investors in that annual payment from the school district. So those interests are known as participating in certificates. So you have a, you're creating a certificate or an agreement to make a payment to this corporate. This now it will be the trust. They sell that to investors. So you're, you're hired. You're right on the money. Uh, they sell it to the investors. The investors, in turn, send $5 million to the trust. This is all happening instantly. So it's not a day, it's not two days, it's not three days. What, in a matter of from 9 a.m. to 9.05 a.m., this happens. The $5 million comes to the trust. The trust sends the $5 million to the school district, along with the keys, and says, here's the money. You're in charge. You, you're you're assigned the rights through the trust to make all the improvements that you need to make. All you have to do is continue to make payments back to me so that, that you make the improvements to the district, you make the payments back to the trust. The trust then makes the payments to the investors that, uh, that's, that gave you the $5 million. And that's kind of the step-by-step -step process through which about 600 pages of documents will represent the, the, what I've boiled down to nine simple steps. Uh, the legal, the, the number one key legal thing that you need to know going into this is that at any point in the future that the board says we are not appropriating that $356,000 rent payment to the trust, the trust instantly, it isn't 
So the Huntington Bank would act as the trustee. They don't give you a day to negotiate. They don't even have an obligation to negotiate. They can, they can padlock all of your school buildings and block your access to those buildings if for any reason you decide uh, that you're not going to appropriate the $356,000. And they're given the right to re-lease those assets to any other entity that might be interested in leasing them for $356,000, which would be a pretty sweet deal for some community school or a charter school uh, to get all of your facilities for $356,000 a year. I might even be interested. So, uh, so that was the quick version. Any questions about it's really not as complicated as it seems until you see the. So in the eight week period, at <coughs> what point does, I mean, is it five million? Is it 3.7? This is a no bid. This is, the, I understood this to be a no bid kind of contract. We're assigning eight, five million dollars to the district. The district's giving five million dollars. Well, that's, uh, it, you're approving up to five million. <clears throat> right. And uh, so, so I, I, we would, I would get that information from John to Tara to say this is this is the exact amount that we need. We're just we, we just put together a placeholder of not to exceed five million, which would include the cost of the, the current estimate. Of, and I, I know we have groups mm -hmm. that are four million eight seventy five. Right. Wait, four million eight seventy five plus the financing expenses. Right. right. I mean, I know we have roof bids. I think we're lower than this. Okay. Okay. So if that turns out, that's, that becomes an even better. So the board, by the passing of the, the resolution, you're establishing sort of the maximums, maximum amount to be financed, the maximum term, the maximum interest rate. And by the way, if interest rates are at six percent, I'm not going to advise Tara to do this. I'm going to say we need to go back to the board and talk about. Uh, talk about this situation. So, so I, I do this regularly. I bond and I bid and I do things as my background. So at what point do we actually control the bidding process so that we have a cost of four million dollars instead of four point five million? Because it feels like we've agreed to it. Again, Mr. Smith, have we agreed to an open agreement with you, or Mr. Smith, is your position for us to bring in the lowest price, to bring in the highest savings and lowest cost for? Groups, ventilation control, which I presume your company doesn't do all of these things here. Is that is that accurate, or am I? Right, doing? Really, what we're doing is we're just managing the project. Right, you're a construction manager for the fee. That's what we're doing. So and a, so we get all the people that three or four different bids on each one of the categories. So and, and we're going to sit down and go through which accomplishes the district's goals and as you generate the most savings, the least cost. So when when do we get those final bids for every project? Before we close on the financing, after we close you on the financing. You gotta do this part first. Pardon? You have to do this part first. That wasn't my question. My question was voting for this gets it forward. There's eight weeks time. Right. When do we when do we get the final bids for all the projects? No, that's what we'll do over the next week. That's what we're in the process of doing now. And you're so I don't know the exact time until we don't you know, we don't have the contract yet, so we're doing that part as well. And and your fee markup in this business is what for your Typically company? Typically seven percent. 7% of the growth. So if you get a contract with John, yeah, John that's a construction manager fee group. So it's similar to anybody else in the construction market. The idea was to create as much capital and free as much cash flow to the district. So normally I don't go to bond market until we have all the bids in place and all the contracts in right. That's typically when I go to bond market. Right. I, don't, I don't normally go there um, in my experience. I assume we won't go to bond market, we won't go finalize until we have all the bids in place and all the contracts. Going to leave that up to. Well, I'm asking you're the construction manager, right? I mean, I, I'm asking you about <laughs> that your role to help us get there. Yeah, mine's the <laughs> technical and energy part. I stick to that part. Financing has got to be done. Yeah, that part. I don't know, I guess I don't. Yeah, I'll just let me, let me redirect the question. So I'm trying to understand your role in a $5 million project so I can understand your position here with the district. Right. And you're, you're, you said you were a construction manager. I think. Right. And so there are. There are chillers, which your company doesn't deliver directly. I think Tremco, if I recall, if that's the parent, was roofing. The okay. parent company's RPM, yes. Yeah, and that's roofing materials predominantly. So that's a real sealants, coatings. Right. Yeah. And so toilet exhaust fans, not your gig, and somebody else. That's right. uh, uh, water soft, uh, water softeners, not your thing. But water valve, right? Correct. Right. So you have to go find somebody to do All these subcontract, right? Correct. And so your role with us when we awarded this bid that was the low bid 
is to go and find all of those purveyors to continue to make it the low bid or lower bid because you get you guesstimate it based on industry knowledge all of the costs of four point eight two five million dollars right. we went through many contractors to get that done so so your role then when you say you're an energy guy your your company is delivering the guarantee to us for just the energy savings and the construction project and the construction project so we have the risk of performance of the construction project. So you're taking construction risk too on a yes. not to exceed price contract. And we'll go no change order. Can't happen. And and when and when do we sign that contract? At the time you close out on the bid. That was where I was heading. So make sure I understand the time that we sign that agreement. So yeah, when you sign the contract, the construction contract earlier between the school district and our company, that's all of all the pricing contracts that we have. Yeah. I guess I'm just trying to clarify. because I haven't done one of these before, so I apologize. Yeah, you're right. And I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands what I'm asking. Because sometimes I don't ask correctly. I'm, I'm trying to be direct. Um, so you did four point something million dollars, which the, the minutes reflect that the budget committee recommended your company because your company had the lowest bid. Mr. Teacher mentioned that several times as well. I believe. That was one part. I'm, I'm focusing on that part right now. They're not saying there's more. And to the extent that you're the low bid, it's your company's expectation that because you bid 4.8 million, that we're signing a 4.8 million dollar not to exceed contract. A not to exceed contract. Yeah. So if you if you bring it in at, I'm going to exaggerate just for conversation to make a point, nothing more, at four million dollars, you're going to you're going to have the benefit because we signed a not to exceed contract that you took the risk. Because I signed not to exceed contracts. So not to exceed, right? So, so, so if we do better, do we get the same? Let's say it's let's say it's two million dollars, right? Pick any match. Not taking off two hundred thousand dollars. We're not going there. We're only using it what we need. So if I need four point eight. Now I need four. We're only going to use four. So I have to then ask my bond expert if we close at five, but the only again at four. That's oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because, because just, just again for the record, my yeah. business is sixty to hundred million dollars a year in gross max contracts. Right. I agree to pay somebody not to exceed for them to take a risk, mm -hmm. and they go out and do that. And if they get savings in some places, they can't keep the savings, and they deliver it back to the companies that I work with. Right. Here. What happens if in eight weeks we close five million dollars, but he delivers it four? As an example, the, we have the, uh, the first thing is that you're committed. The financing, the total dollar of the amount of the financing, isn't locked in stone until we get to the uh, eight. Uh, we can't. Seven point seven right nine. Right, and so when you hopefully we have a pretty good feel by that particular point what the number is, but at that point we. Your financing becomes a permanent financing. We create in the financing option a document, however, the ability to pay it off. I mentioned earlier that if uh, I wasn't thinking savings from the bidding, I was thinking actually savings as a result of operating performance of the district, lower interest rates. Uh, the district has the ability to pay off the financing obligation uh, in the future with, with any excess proceeds. Uh, so that would be I mean, the, the next option that would be out for the district. So that would be something the trust indenture that would specify that there be a prepayment of capital. It right. doesn't adjust the amortization potentially only shortens the life of the loan. Right. So we find ourselves with a million dollars of extra money. It doesn't have to be just for the bidding. It could be three years from now. You know, let's say there's a settlement. The district gets another extra million dollars. Or we'll you want to have those flexibilities. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess my question. I guess I appreciate the uh, detailed conversation. Thank you, Mr. Petrie, for allowing this to occur because, you know, th there is a concern that I raised in the previous motion of uh, what appeared to be a conflict and uh, some concerns, and that is in the record in a minute. So I'm on record of that. Uh, I'm also concerned of a, you know, what I would call a gross max price contract because they tend to be gross max price. I mean, we give you a number, you hit the number, and life's good, and we go there. So I have 
those concerns. And the third concern that I think you could raise, there's a thank you very much tonight for your explanation of the debt instrument, but this truly is a debt instrument, and we are we are absorbing an obligation that the, the community is responsible for. Okay. Thank you. David, I'd like to say I appreciate your knowledge on this, but one of the reasons we did choose to go with this company is part of the, the max debt process, because when I build a house as well, I like to be able to control how much money is put into that house. When we're in control of the subcontractors in the bid process, we can select who we want and talk to those subcontractors. A lot of these companies wouldn't allow that. I, I am unaware of your explanation right now. I appreciate what you're saying. There's no knowledge that I have that we are going to be in the next eight weeks sitting here tonight at this mm -hmm. table, that uh, this district will be uh, looking to bring in more savings because of the volume of business in this bond versus hit the number <coughs> as a scenario. So as you understand the construction industry, what that means, mm -hmm. it's not to beat anybody down or to keep anybody from right. making a living. Well, great so in any case, those are things I'm not aware of as we're sitting here tonight because I haven't, we haven't had this discussion. So thank you for the time, Mr. President. Can uh, anybody answer the question as to whether this is a installment payment contract under Revised Code 3313.372? If nobody knows, that's fine. I, no, I know it's no, kind it, of an off the wall question. No, it is not. But, uh, it's okay. So if I. So, are, are there any other questions about the structure of the financing or the liability that it creates again, so that there's clarity that even though you can get out of it, you really can't? Or if you did, there's going to be trouble. Uh, I, my job is to provide advice and recommendations. Uh, there are two issues at hand. The first is the approach to the construction and all of that. The other is the approach to the financing resolution that you have before you tonight only deals with the financing. To the extent you're comfortable with the financing and you realize that it takes at least eight weeks for us to move forward, um, I would recommend that it's in your best interest in the community that you, you proceed and adopt the resolution. Uh, at least let the financing part stop and start. It doesn't obligate you to finance it. Again. It does allow you, however, to start the financing process. So if we vote and move that ahead and there turns out to be some other action that shows up for some other reason that is outside of our control, yes. what are we obligated to if we have to stop this in four weeks? Your, your first is that you're not obligated to borrow any money or finance any project. And then from a cost perspective, uh, until you hit week five, there is no cost from any of the experts or the professionals involved. Once you get to the rating presentation, that's when the costs start to, to start to accumulate. So you have five weeks of time to move the, the financing process forward, get everything kind of uh, sort of in the position that uh, you want it to be able to make a final decision and then make a final decision. I wouldn't recommend making a rating presentation until you were for sure you were proceeding with the transaction. Because it would, from a rating perspective, it doesn't look good say we're borrowing and then all of a sudden say, oh, never mind, you changed their mind. But, yeah, I, I guess the only thing if there's an amendment to the resolution, I, I'm on, my uncomfortableness is not knowing the strength of the guarantor or the language of the guarantor or really what we end up, what we're in, what we're really going out to market to say that our lease is 100% covered so that when I go and people ask me, I just voted on investing X millions of dollars with the knowledge that the savings within that over the approximate 20 year term will pay for itself. And I don't have that comfort sitting here to issue the financing. And I don't know where that guarantee language or document, because carve outs and guarantees are as important as the paper that are written on. And a guarantee can be only as good as what's in the bank in that period of time. So that's my only other caveat that I would like to consider maybe as an amendment to the motion. Is that somewhere, or it's a second motion, that there's some aspect of this? Because, Mr. Anderson, I believe you're the one who mentioned to me that this is, in your explanation, this is a guarantee, and we're not going to, we have nothing to lose. I don't know where that is anywhere that's been presented tonight or in previous meetings that shows the liquidity, the net worth, the, the language of that guarantee. Perhaps it's here, perhaps it will show up. I just don't know what the process would be. And I might consider that we have some concern about that so that we can. 
Who would be able to represent it to the community? Here's the uh, trim to it. Uh, whoever the company is. Whoever the company is that we're contracting with is going to give us a guarantor. I mean, I'll give you the example. I bought a house that had a 10 year warranty on it. The company was a very well known builder, Grease. They closed their company, opened up another company, their guarantee went worthless. And I had no guarantee, but I still had a house and Grease reopened under another name. So they went out and voided everybody's guarantee on a thousand houses they built. So I have a personal experience in my home where I had a piece of paper from the guy that I bought the house from today. I got eight more years left, the next thing you know, I had to deal with it myself. So I would hate for us to have that problem. Not that it would happen with Mr. Smith, with his reputation, I'm not going there. I'm talking about the LLC or the entity that is giving this assurance to us. That's from a legally binding obligation. That's correct. So within the next four weeks, is there any assurance that Anything that could address Mr. Petroni's concerns? Yeah, we always have given uh, Mr. Fidel contracts with him. I, 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 again, I, I don't know what that I apologize. I, I'm not involved in that. I don't know what that means. But liquidity, net worth, validity of that guarantee being substantiated by somebody, I don't know who does that in our industry of school education. It is probably not me. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an expert on that. But I don't know what that means, and I have to do it. So I anticipate bond council to review that on the school behalf. And it's all the school projects that I've done in the last 20 years. Pat Schaefer, I know very well. If they're bond council, if they can, if they can give an opinion on the liquidity and worth of the entity that's signing that, that would be that would probably go a long way. And to he help. is the bond council that will be on this. I he's the one that's already came to resolutions. Will you be able to have something yeah. for him to review before we would get to that? If we proceed tonight, and then before we get to past week four, we would have something for him to give an opinion that if we're good and stuff. If I may offer a suggestion, the carve outs on this guarantee are as important as the liquidity of the network. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What a fun point question. Uh, so, are we saying this project uh, structurally is on hold until eight for eight weeks until we get our money, or are we able to proceed in some fashion uh, before that? During those eight weeks, Mr. Smith and I will be working to, to finalize the, the specific things that will be going on and all that. And so, hopefully, by the time week six hits, we'll have the information from Bond Council. We'll have the information from Mr. Smith on the guarantee. We'll have more of a specific number on what we've done. Uh, Mr. Smith has done a lot of work, and you know, just since we got it approved January third, uh, in terms of engineering and things like that. So he's moving forward. I'm moving forward on our side to make sure that this project is going to be ready, so that when the financing is ready, we can start doing some things. As soon as we can, because for a short window to get some of these things in before winter hits. Great, thank you. Well, you it was very well done. We appreciate you both of you. Thank very, you. Very helpful. With that, do we have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. What, what are we motioning? To, to begin the, the financing process, like he said, that doesn't obligate us to have to finance, but it just allows us to start the process. Um, he wanted to know exactly what we're voting on tonight. Now, this is just for us to start the process and us to start to get the team together of the right. underwriters. And right. So the, that particular resolution authorizes the, the terms of the financing structure. Terms. It uh, assigns the responsibilities to execute the terms of the contract to the board president, the superintendent, and to the CFO. Uh, more than likely, well, not more than likely, before any final financing structure is done, we will come back and say this is where things are. So, uh, but with the passage of the resolution, it retains our services, it retains the services of Peck Chamber and Williams, it gives uh, is for the uh, responsibility of hiring an investment banker so we can put the financing team formally put the financing team together. They're getting advice without necessarily a formal contract. Uh, get those folks together and then we can get started moving down the process of doing the official statement. I guess the only reason why I asked is 
the, the clarity here tonight for my vote on this is the requests that I had, which are excluded from the resolution that was just made. And I'm at, I guess I'm asking if the specificity of liquidity, net worth, carve outs, covenants on the guarantee, uh, bidding be complete before we go to market, uh, price be fixed. Because right now, you know, a 6% interest rate is a good cushion when you're at 4 3 right. in the document that we're voting on. Is better. I think she will tell you. Yeah, I'm not going there. I'm just saying. Can you make it five? Yeah, I did. I thought I just asked you if the motion needs to be amended or if I need to add it to the record for my vote. What would you suggest, Mr. President? Because I think those are areas that I would consider to be personally considered the important place in the discussion. Yeah, I think I think your thoughts and your concerns have been evident. And I think at this point, you're welcome to. I think you've already expressed those reservations or thoughts, and you're welcome to do so. I think we're going to go ahead and vote on this to move this forward so we can proceed, knowing that five weeks from now we're going to, we're going to talk about this again. Yeah. And if, at the point when we talk about it again, we'll make sure that those, in the meantime, all of those documents and the concerns are addressed before we actually proceed to the actual financing resolution to go further from now. This is just allowing us to start a process that's not obligating us to do it. So what you're understanding is the administration is a good consensus of this board with those concerns. That's what you're understanding. Right. I so like we'll it. make sure well we'll right. So we'll make sure that when we come back in an additional time, I mean I think what you're trying to say is I understand your concerns and we want to move forward tonight on this point to get it started but all of those concerns will be addressed before we go any further when we come back the next time so you're understanding that's a consensus of this board those are concerns that you're going to make sure are addressed i will no, make sure I'm, i will make sure that i address them for your benefit but i'm not sure that they're consensus of everybody consensus. But. i don't think everybody i think everybody has their own opinion so at this point i think we just we just need to make take a vote and uh, move forward. And either I think I think we're all. I mean, the gentleman did a great job. Yeah. We're very appreciative. I understand better. So and I understand your thoughts. So um, I think we just need to get this started. So let's call for it. I just, if I may, Mr. Anderson, just one very brief comment. Um, thank you, Mr. Conway. I, I'm going to vote against this just because the way I see this agreement is we're turning over to the title of all the Spring Road taxpayer facilities to a third party. And I'm just not prepared to go there tonight. So uh, go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Petroni? As much as I'd like to approve it, I was hoping for a more of a consensus of the board on this issue, so I'll never know this time. Um, Regalo? No. And Stupid? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you again. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. So we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Yes, uh, 4.1 policy revisions for second reading. I know it's been a while in this. These have been discussed a lot. That is promotion and retention. If there's any questions about those, Ms. Benson is here to fill your questions. Yeah, it's uh, policy 5410 promotion and retention. Is there a motion? So, so we just have a second. Um, this is the second reading. There's something, something wrong with this all night. It won't work, and it doesn't reload. I'm not sure if it's because there's such a long period of time that goes by <laughs> before it <laughs> so, But um, it's not working, so. Um, I don't see it. If you could just stay with me for a second. Sure. I'm trying to get it reloaded. I 
and then all have together. Four or five people mm -hmm. throughout the district. Correct. Okay. Is this, I knew there was more each. than one FTE doing right. it. So. Yeah. I just got confused. It didn't put that was nothing up. So maybe just if you don't mind looking out for this, just send this for you just to look at it. Yeah. Just being at this I was trying to understand $212,000 is. And that's 16, what they always look like. $16,000 a day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, just more. I mean, even if there's five people, that's still like. Well, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how many people. I know that this is what the contract that we approve looks like every year. Um, because I used to have them where I came from too. So they always look like this. And then there's a subsequent that shows the breakdown of how many people times how many days. But because it, it's special ed, that would probably be true so that would know that. So even if it's $3,000 a day, that seems reasonable? That's, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm, and right now, that is it what we're paying the ESC. And we're okay with that because that's just what they so that's one of our few options right now. We're trying to, just like a, the, the hit the coordinator, the uh, testing coordinator contract, I'm trying to take on as much as I can. We took on preschool last year. Now there's one school in Warren County left doing preschool. We're trying to take these things on ourselves, but it is a lot to maintain because these people have a particular license. Uh, they're a rare commodity in the education field because they're also using private industry, therefore their salaries are different. Uh, you have to bring them in. Uh, depending on either a private contract or and or they come into one of our associations. So there's a lot of variables that come to play, but I'm not going to repeat that it's expensive, no. And we have looked at other companies. We have had another company. They were able to save us in a couple areas, but then they were more in other areas. So. I was just more trying to understand 13. That's a great question. I'm not going to disagree. The only other question I have in the contract, have we paid a penalty to them in the past because we didn't use their services? No. So that's absolutely not. We can't ever get that language stricken then, right? That says if we do a minimal of stuff, they're going to charge us. Some well, due to the fact. It's complicated how this works. We, we are in a pool and essentially belong to the ESC from a state method. That's why they were going to do some funding through the ESCs. So it's, we would have to give you specific information. It is. It's on weird. It's a pool of money and it's a pool of services, and they split the services between each of the districts and they pay their portion and they spread the services around. It's a whole pool of. I just want to make sure number four or yeah, four is something that we're not going to we all of us. And for the record, I am not saying anything negative about the ESC. I'm not either. I'm just asking you that. I'm just, my job is to look out for the district. Just asking for a question. Question on the, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, the youth, the youth diversion services person, uh, there's a line item for like $12,000. Correct. And then uh, other other places in the uh, agenda, that we're talking about a crisis intervention mm -hmm. and salary Fair structure. Person. So my question, I guess, is: Is a twelve thousand then is part of her salary paid by ESC, or is it, is the twelve thousand on top of what uh, her salary is here? It's included. It's I'm, included. It's included. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And one of the reasons we pay that is it allows our person to work exclusively with children's services. Even if our kids end up going to court, our person is able to go into court and stand with them in front of the judge and provide services. Dr. Miller, would you just ask, and maybe I understand the answer, would you just ask if that number is 50 in the other document, is is it now 62.8? Is that the question that you just asked? Me? That, in essence, yes. And, in when essence. You, and when you just answered it's included, does that mean it's 50 to us and it's, it's 38 to us? No. Or is it, so it's not included. So we're, we're paying $12,811 to the ESC for her yes. services. Plus, then we also pay her for daily services. I think that's correct. That's what I was trying to say. It's a combination that creates her salary. That's what I was trying to clear. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess yes. I have another issue with that because I'm not sure that that is permissible under the law for us to to have a person on our payroll and then also create a subcontract, which is what we're doing with the ESC. I think we ought to review that and verify that that is, a, in fact, a legal arrangement. Be happy, never been asked that question, but we'd be happy to review it. She's been doing that for 12 years. For 12 years. Doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> but first time I've seen it, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. If I missed it last year, I missed it. I'd be happy to find that. You know, we've, we've 
We've well, talked about that issue before, where an employee can't, uh, you know, kind of swing two ways. So I think, yeah. Uh, uh, at Loveland, we had people that did that same exact thing. They worked through the ESC, and then they also were on their payroll. As long as they don't get a 1099. So, uh, I mean, I'm not you sure how that whole that thing works, but we can actually get check into okay. it. I think they would be good to check. Do they get a W-2 from ESC and a W-2 from us? I assume so. Well, doesn't it have to be? It was under 599. Yeah, that'll have to be checked out. I think it's happy to check that out. Good question. Good question. Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Petroni? Okay, Regano? Yes. And Stu? Yes. Motion passes. Item 4.4. Mm -hmm. 4.4 is the approval of creation of the administrative position. This is for a testing coordinator. Let me give a little bit of background on this, why I'm proposing this. Last year, uh, at least for two of the board members, and probably Dr. Malone as well, we did an efficiency plan before I did go through and evaluate the ESC's contracts. One of the things that we removed from the contract was the school coordinator position. We are required to have one of those. Uh, and it's for our special needs students who work and our special ed director would go out of the evening or on the weekends and check into their place of employment. We were paying the ESC $16,000. Okay? That, you are voting on tonight, will go to Ms. Vincent since she's assuming the role of special ed director for no increased salary payment. Therefore, we don't have to hire one, but it will be a supplemental to her for $8,000. So that's a savings of $8,000. With the testing coordinator and the CCIP, both supplementals we have on this year, what we found with the CCIP in this district is it was not being completed properly. Tara was actually one of the people who helped us to get that together. Tammy overtook that last year and ended up in Columbus multiple days and on the weekends getting that done because in the past, someone had been hired just for the CCIP, our Title I, and our gifted coordinator. That was just one position as it is in most districts. So then you not only incur the salary, you incur the health benefits on top of that. So with this testing coordinator position, this is not something we can add to someone's workload. It is an extremely extensive position that is going to either be done after the hours or we're going to have to pay the ESC to do it. You can see by their hourly rates, $8,000 will not even get close to covering this position. It would be the, but the CCIP, we look quickly at, it'll at least be 40 hours at $300 an hour. So, with these things, the reason I'm doing these, instead of paying the ESC, which it's hard to argue when it's on here, and I say to you, we have to have someone oversee the CCIP. We have to have a testing coordinator for the district. These are things we have to have. We either can pay our own people, who I can trust to get it done right, or we can pay more to the ESC so that perhaps Mr. Pinnell will not make his 98000 plus $8,000 more next year for a total of $106,000. In this profession, for a position that he has, $106,000 is not that much compared to the competitive field right now. So from, from my standpoint, we're not having to hire another employee. We in fact reduced a central office employee this year and paying half the price to the ESC. This is a savings to the district. If I'm predicting 24,000, I think it would be more over the three contracts that are proposed to you tonight, which will pay for one of our special updates. The other option, if this isn't voted for, to get this testing coordinator position and I'm going to come back next week and have it on the ESC's contract because we do not have the staff to oversee this. If there's any analysis that needs to be done, you will see a district of this size. We are very light when it comes to administrators, extremely light. So our option is to either pay John who will do this evening and weekends or we go through the ESC. So with that said, I would like the position of testing coordinator approved tonight for $8,000. That will be annually reviewed each year. If by chance we were to change staff next year and add an employee center off, that may be something that I'm able to add to that job description and then we will no longer pay that um, in a supplemental contract for one of our employees. So Mr. Pinnell's contract is a 260 day contract right now. Yes, so he is. now you're 300 days. <laughs> Evening, weekend, well. So you're 300. What is that called? That's a call over time. 
I don't give over time. <laughs> I, I guess you said two things that confused me, mm -hmm. Mr. Petrie. One, you said, I think you said, I don't want to word you but you just said that what we're paying Mr. Brunel is not enough, therefore this is a way to compensate him more, and with that he'll add more hours to his day, which equates to about 30 days of work. No, I've been questioning about why we will now have employees that are higher paid. Why do we have these high paid employees? In comparison to other districts in education, there is a job market. There is a salary structure in place. And in the administrative field right now, for the position job Mr. Pinnell has, he is hardly overpaid. In some people's eyes, perhaps, but as far as the salary index in the profession, no. So, so you're asking for a raise for Mr. Pinnell, technically. I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. No, I'm not asking for a raise. He will perform the function. If he's not the one to do it, then I will gladly come back and have it on the ESC contract and not for sure what they'll charge for that. For the school coordinator position of 16000 we're getting it done here for eight. I remember that conversation <laughs> right to our testing coordinator seems to be a student services type plan. And I mean, Mr. Pinnell is great at it doing what he does, the business manager, the district manager, the facilities, can you explain the, the rationale for having him? Mr. Pinnell was a teacher and also a building level principal. He's very knowledgeable about structure. One of the criteria I have when I hire central office administrators, they had to serve as building well, administrators. Well, thank you. I did not know that. Oh, yes. you know. He was so, he, he's so good at facilities, I assume that he must have done that his entire life. No. Um, no, he but I, I guess I have one other reservation with this. Um, I mean, Tammy Lee and John are all on 260-day contracts. I mean, at their rate, we're looking at another 40 hours. Mm -hmm. Tara pointed out he's here all the time anyway, mm -hmm. Do, just doing his regular job. I mean, I can't imagine adding this additional work to them and expecting them to do an effective job with it. I, I think that I think that's unfair to them to do that. And uh, to, to ask them to put in their after hours and weekend time mm -hmm. to do these things. I, people need time off and away to, to refresh and reload. And uh, I, I, I would rather, I mean, I would rather have the ESC do it so that they can actually have a life outside of this place. Uh, it would be, would be my brother's most to be true. If they choose not to take the position, then <laughs> we, I could reopen it. It has to be an administrator to do one of these functions. So it is their choice if they would like to take it. We have other administrators that aren't on 260 day contracts, too. But, but we do need people who understand what needs to be done with these three functions. It's very complex. <coughs> Where it would take someone who really knows what they're doing. Yes, I, I understand and, and support uh, really what you're asking here. Um, the only thing that I, I, I uh, am thinking about here is that in the field of education, um, we have asked more of everyone in the last several years, taking on more responsibilities. So uh, the, the teaching, the teachers here. And the teachers everywhere, you know, have taken on more and more responsibilities. Also, um, and in our case here, uh, without a pay raise, okay, and so I'm um, setting. I, I think to some degree we're we're setting a little bit of a precedent here. Uh, of extra work means extra pay, which I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but I, I think that that could be a, a point that's brought up to us uh, when when it comes time for our uh, our, our negotiations. Absolutely. So, and, and we do have supplementals for the teachers, as you know. It's just from my standpoint, which I hope you understand, I need the functions complete. Um, working with Mrs. Vincent on these, these things have to be filled. So one way or the other, someone is going to have to complete these job functions. And uh, if they are willing to do it, um, then we'll move forward with them. If not, if you post it and or we will seek guidance through the educational service center. I guess I, I would echo what Dr. Miller just said. Consensus to be had. I would hate to be said you know, any type of precedent because there is a lot of work to be done. And I don't plan on I would also make a job as Just I don't want to believe specialists there. I just think maybe the ES, maybe it's a time to put this in the ESC and, and then work through that to see how work goes here. These supplementals have been granted in this district before. The testing coordinator by itself, it has. 
it was an individual administrative position at Central Office. If I may interject just a couple of um, data points, and I do appreciate you looking out for my best interest, <laughs> and I'm sure my children and my husband do also. Um, a couple of things. Um, looking at this past year, we did have some uh, testing and discrepancies mm -hmm. given, um, and that, was, that pertained to someone that had never been a building administrator, um, has solely worked in ESCs and, and other places and the job was not done correctly, and it's going to impact us in one way or another. Not sure exactly, uh, working with Tammy with ODE, we've resubmitted some special ed um, testing information. Um, uh, pretty much an entire school was missed, being uh, marked correctly on the booklets. Um, and another effect we have had, the work study coordinator, which uh, it is being looked at, um, to be seen, overseen by me, um, for the past two years, um, the first two years ago, through the ESC, that person that oversaw it was never available for our district, and the program was not completed. And uh, last year, due to some interesting um, personnel in this district, um, that money went to someone who did not complete that program either. So, um, you know, and the CCIP, we have worked and been in Columbus, and we're already doing that work anyway. So and pull back enough money from doing it right to pay for a whole other special. Um, I, and at this point, uh, Dr. Malone, to the to the point of the extra, the extra time, um, extra work, extra money. Um, the fact is, is it, it's going to be done regardless. Um, so if you all feel that, you know, um, this isn't in the best interest of, of the group, I personally will oversee the program anyway, um, because it goes under um, my job description that is now being the special coordinator. But mostly, I would speak for myself as this is what's best for the district and what's best for kids. And I will say also that some people that have come in and gone out of this district, um, as much time as they worked, um, the data would question exactly how hard they worked. So we can either work harder and more, or we can work smarter. Um, and I, for one, am more for the smarter and do believe that I could fulfill the position. Thank you. Well, so in short, gentlemen, where I'm trying to deliver to your product done properly. And I'm not, I don't get on television and bash any other agencies, but we need to get things done right. We've encountered things not being done right, and we dealt with it. But uh, you learn from some of your purchases, and you don't do it again. I do think that the testing coordinator, by the nature of the job, and, and uh, Lee, you hit, you hit it in one of your comments about availability. Uh, it's very important from the building level from principal to be able to contact the district testing coordinator and make sure that they do get that. Right. So, you know, I, I really think there's a benefit in having that in-house person. Um, will this person be able to deliver data on a timely basis on testing so that there's not a two-week or three-week lag time? In is that part of this goal? I mean, it's that mm -hmm. simple. So, I mean, sure. these people are, it's $8,000. And the, the hours that it takes to do that, uh, if you're asking for immediate uh, data, once again, I've asked that if we could be given two weeks when we have these requests of great need, unless the entire board feels it's an urgency, we will drop what we're doing to get that taken care of. I'm just asking, I'm looking at the duties, I'm just asking if this position is going to be able to deliver data, whether it's to the public on request whether it's to a board member on request, whatever the time frame is. It depends on that. that. Because it's a lot of the last couple of weeks, there's been a conversation, which I think you just echoed again, that people are busy. So adding another, I guess I'm, I, I agree with what you're trying to do. I just am struggling, not trying to hire another full-time person. I understand what Ms. Vincent said as well. The problem with our debt, I believe, is pretty much set it all next week. We don't have it all in. So therefore, all this data we've been giving out for records requests that's being used out there is not complete. Now, I've mentioned that to the board. Our data is not complete. There are still things under review in the state. They're liable to change something, and we're going to come back higher. We will not come back lower. I'm not even so, I'm uh, more, not specific on action. I'm just talking about a general mm -hmm. question that we wanted to know about the status of third grade reading. 
we wanted to know on the next two years basis. Is it push a button or will this position be able to deliver to the board so we can determine if there's a policy adjustment or we can support your policy adjustments are there? And that's what I'm just asking if this position is going to be able to deliver those results or is this We currently do not have an active data, data warehouse with a dashboard. I don't know if you know exactly what I mean by that data. I do. Um, when you ask for data, it is calculations of one of the three people in our curriculum department, of which only one is here right now. It would be great to have one of those uh, data warehouses. We've looked at those. They're extremely expensive. Not to say that we may not look at that down the road, but uh, at this point, we still are doing it the old-fashioned way. We're looking through pages and breaking it down into a Excel file before it's sent to you. Yes, yeah. would you like to add to that? Yeah. I do have one thing I, I would like to share in regards to the to the data piece. Uh, we do have a, a data warehouse which is called Testing Works, and there's going to be an upgrade to that, which we think uh, some of those upgrades are are going to help facilitate some of this on a on a kind of um, management basis and. Oftentimes we have to obviously pull that data in such a way that um, you know we're waiting on information from state and we're waiting on um, you know uh, those upgrades that they often do. So I, I think this next year coming up with the with the upgrades to the testing works, I think we're going to have a, a little bit of accessibility that's going to be worthy of of um, a timeliness. So you know, and it's it's really interesting because I think the data that does come to us. We just have to define exactly what it is that we want to know. And so when we give general information or we give the data as it is, raw data, then that's going to only answer some of our questions. Right. So I think we need to define exactly what it is that we want to know and what we're trying to our, our, you know, get our questions answered so that we can be prepared to do so and respond accordingly. Um, Paterni? Uh, no, the reason stated, not because I don't think there's a need. Uh, Regano? No. Stuffy? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Motion passes. From the Director of Human Resources report. Item 5.1 5, item 5 .1 is for the approval of additional summer hours for uh, certified personnel, and this is for Ms. Lori Dreyer, who did additional summer hours at her daily rate for 1 through 8 uh, professional development uh, and gifted planning. Your motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Um, Anderson? Yes. Malone? Yes. Attorney? Yes. Regano? Yes. Stuckey? Yes. Motion passes. Item 5.2 is for the approval of updated salary schedules for the following personnel. Central Office Custodial Rate, Crisis Intervention Coordinators for years 2013-14 and the upcoming school year 14-15. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Um, oh, Mr. Anderson. Go ahead. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, our contract with the SCA provides is that uh, we're, we're to, we, we have a committee out there that's looking at uh, performance-based pay, and uh, it strikes me that uh, that. If, if we're asking if, if we're asking SEA to do that, I hope. I think that's me. Um, it, it it seems inconsistent not to do that with uh, other staff, and so. Uh, uh, not that I don't support the numbers that are in the schedule, but I just think that uh, 
we should devise a structure that's uh, consistent with what uh, we're working on with uh, other staff. Any other discussion? Just wanted to see a red line. Whatever you can change. If that's possible. Yeah. Well, Mr. Petrie, you, you, you had stepped out and asked the question, why aren't we pursuing a performance-based pay with this particular uh, salary, uh, this group of employees? Uh, we're doing that with the teachers uh, in our agreement with SEA, and, and uh, it seems inconsistent not to do that with who are not, I mean, these are not union folks here, right, in these schedules that, that we're approving. And uh, I really think that, um, and, and I don't object to the numbers that are in the salary schedule, mm -hmm. but uh, rather than have the automatic raises and, and all that stuff, I think that it's always good that people, you know, are, are, have that performance review and that the compensation is tied to that performance. And I'm, I'm curious as to why we're not doing that with this group Well, it's not to say we haven't discussed it with them. I've actually met with, uh, actually, Ms. Jarvis and I met with them before she left. We've had discussions. The thing is, we have nothing in place now. So for us, putting a performance-based uh, process in place is very lengthy, very costly. Um, I'm not going to get any synopsis on it now. I don't think that would be right. But nonetheless, um, we have had the discussions. So for us to feel we've never had that, that discussion being accurate, but we do not have one this time. Yes. 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 Motion passes on 5.3. 5.3 is the approval approval of additional summer hours for the literacy coordinator. Give them the uh, 10 to 15 days in July needed for the additional work on the K-12 instructional framework. K through 10th AIMS web scheduling and planning the district rollout and the PD for that. The CCIP planning and K-5 data summer Title I program, the finalization and evaluation of that in the course of study research for the elementary. There's a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Anderson? Yes. Hello. Yes. Attorney? Yes. Rebellion? Yes. Yes. Motion passes. 5.4. 5.4 is the approval of additional days for administrative personnel. This is going to Tara Hunter. She is the incumbent uh, new dentist principal. She had an additional 12 days as that transition process from Sandy Ray, who has been there uh, since Dennis opened, um, to do the transition process. And that was at her per diem rate. Is there a motion? So moved. Third second. 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 Discussion. Just a quick question on all these. Have we kept these been captured in the budget, or is it something that's just all made that's going to be picked up on our side? Well, let's keep in mind too, she makes almost twenty thousand dollars less than Sandy Ray did. There so. are some And this is very customary from district to district. Any principal's position that I would take, I typically start at July 1st and the whole month was paid to get ramped up to be for kids. Yeah, I guess what I've asked in the past, and I just, I don't know, I, I can do the math through 7 2, 9, 7, 3 times 12, perhaps we can find out how much money we're we'll approving and totaling down the road. Mm -hmm. I think it does that on the whole time. It's just. Well, keep in mind, though, as an assistant principal, you had already approved 10 days for Tara Hunter last year. No, I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying when we make a motion, I'm voting on through 17 times 12, it looks like it's about $4,000, $5,000. And then we just approved maybe $30,000, $30,000. I don't know what we just approved in total. When I started, when I had started, because I, I had 
agree with you. It helps when um, getting ready to revise, you know, the five year board and all of the information of changes that have occurred along the way. And so I do already have a spreadsheet of everything that's been approved since the May update. Um, the additions and subtractions. So I do have that. Yeah, I'm just saying just going forward for me, just help me see the big picture and all this stuff. Yes. 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 I would like to apologize to any of our guest speakers. I know we have a physician here to speak to us tonight. Unfortunately, we still do have quite a bit to go through to get to work session. I apologize. <laughs> if by any chance it's not convenient or conducive to your schedule, we can reschedule. It's totally up to you. <laughs> Item 5.5. This is an approval, uh, I'm looking for approval to employ contracted services for preschool. Um, this is an occupational therapist. You will notice um, as the questions came up earlier on the Warren County contract that her rate is 54 an hour. We do contract her specifically because we don't go through the county for the preschool program, but that does show you the $9 an hour uh, difference and what we pay as opposed to what we're more county pays. So we are looking for the approval for a contract with service with Crystal Lorenz uh, for occupational therapy for our preschool students. Is there a motion? I'd like to move to authorize 50500 dollars and fifty cents, which is the total for this amount of money for this employee contract. So he, he did the total. I just multiplied. Oh, okay. It's not fifty thousand dollars for one day. That's just for the record. Shouldn't use more people, more party Okay. And I would like to thank Mrs. Benson for making that happen because typically we would be spending about 65 or 67 for that same position. So thanks for buying that person. You should be congratulated for that. Does this person get, uh, by being contracted, do they get benefits? No, they do not. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Charlie's motion, and then, uh, is there a second? Yes. 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 Motion passes. 5.6 is the approval of additional summer hours for certified personnel. Um, the list of teachers um, worked one day extra at the $75 a day during the summer, their summer in order to complete the student learning objective developments that will be implemented <coughs> next year. Um, this is in compared to the $100 or more that we would have a sub during the year, um, as we talked about a little earlier tonight. Um, so there was a savings in this um, as them taking time out of their summer to come in and work on this. Any motion? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Yes. 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 Motion passes. 5.7. <coughs> Item 5.7 is another circumstance where we had some teachers come in for an additional uh, 1 and 7.75 hours um, on, a, on a meeting. They needed to come in, and that was on their contracted time, $26.44 an hour. Okay. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. Just one question operationally. There's a couple of these kind of dates. Is that something that we can do? Is that just because we have meetings in June? Or these are, this is like for June 11th, I think. These are after school, the school year is over. Yeah, but we're, approved, we're, 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 we're authorizing the payment. Would you already pay them, I guess? That I don't know. That would be a treasurer's question. Um, I don't believe we do that yet. I want to get paid. I'm not trying to stop I, that. I'm just I saying. do not believe we paid them yet. However, I would have to double check. 
it's all these things. I'm just, we're voting on things, it's July 22nd for things in the last month, so I'm just asking operationally, I haven't seen that before, so I don't want to pull up. It's like you've got six months and you've got four days. Yeah. Okay. I'll check. I don't think I'm taking it. Stoogie? Yes. 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 Passes 5.8. Again, this is approval for the SLO development for a different group of um, teachers that worked on a different day for their SLO development. A motion. So moved. <coughs> second. Second. Roll call. Yes. 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 Motion passes. Item five point nine. For the superintendent who has already approved these, I bring it forward for board approval, and they are sixty-nine items for approval um, to employ different substitutes or resignations or hires that we have done this summer. Okay. Motion. So moved. There a second. Second. Welcome. Yeah. Um, before we do that, Mr. Anderson, yeah. I, I would like to divide this into 4.A and 4. Point, I'm sorry, 5.9A and 5.9B, and take items 6, 7, and 8, uh, and make those 5.9B, uh, uh, because I really feel that we need to save these administrators from themselves. Um, so uh, if we could separate that, I would appreciate that. So, I mean, because those have to do with the three administrator? These the three administrative supplemental contracts. I'd like to make those item 5.9B, and we would vote on the uh, balance of the list is A, and then we uh, uh, those items, those line items 6, 7, Yep. Um, that is a separate item. This is going to save them from themselves? Yes. <laughs> oh, don't they can't tell me how Save them from Mr. Petrie, I think. No. Of course he's right, Mr. Pennell. For the record, I can stand up for myself. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. okay, so, so it's yeah. okay. 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 This is part of a consent agenda item, and when, it, when there's a, a list of items a board member may request, then it just be divided if there's no need for a motion. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm not sure we're voting on we are, we are um, doing 5.0A, which is the personnel. The non administrators. Mm -hmm. Six, and then the three administrators will be 5.9A. 66 I'm voting yes. Okay. That's the turn. I will vote this as well. Then Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Motion passes on 5.9B. And this is the three administrators. Is there a motion? Okay. Third second. Second. Yes. Yes. Attorney. No. Morgana. No. Stupid. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Second. No. Motion passes. And moving on to six point one. Approval of textbook adoption. Yes, and this is the one that was amended. Uh, it's 5 9. You want to read Mr. 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 Sorry, 5 5 9 10, Mr. President. I believe that I'll have two more. Oh, I'll have two more. Really? Charles, you know, those will go to the board. I don't have that for the board. Approval change half the ad. Yeah, sure. Approval of the language. It says approval will change half time high school language arts position to full time. I apologize. I apologize, we should update your book right now. 
So, all right, item 5.10. It's 5.10. What this is, and I sent you an email today, we had a teacher resign, which you just voted on. She taught French and English for a cost of, I think, $71,500 a year. We currently have a junior high teacher who does uh, physical education and French. So we're finding a French teacher this time of year extremely difficult. So we're, she is asked to move to the French position. Uh, what we will then need to do is hire a part-time physical education person. Due to the fact that the teacher who just resigned actually teaches four periods a day, correct? Four periods a day. Um, that's more than part-time. We're already scheduled next year to hire a full-time teacher. So what I'm recommending to you, actually, human resources, because you have to prove your resignation first, is to go ahead and go with a full-time person. And the benefit of that is, number one, our English classes at the high school are running between 28 and 31. This will reduce those class sizes by two or three students. Plus, it will allow us to go ahead and get the full-time teacher in so that we can on-ramp the new textbooks so that while we have the major support from the company we're working with, we will be able to make sure that teacher is trained properly to be able to do what we're wanting to do in class. So it's kind of twofold what it's going to be able to do. But with that said, all of that cost will still not exceed what we were paying the teacher who just resigned. So it's not an impact to the five-year forecast. Is there a motion? Second. 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 Is there any discussion? Roll call. Yes. 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 Motion passed. Okay. Yes, and the approval, and Mr. Edinburgh wants to talk about this before we go to this, but the approval will be to adopt textbooks in grade 612. But in sixth grade, we want to continue to pilot math digits. And the reason for that, well, bottom line is our data was not that good in that area. Uh, we had two brand new teachers 